Meanwhile, Debbie has finally had enough of this picture and wanders off. I know how she feels. After a thorough search of the house... Debbie! Debbie! Or not, they decide to look for her outside. Manos, the hand-holding of fate. Fortunately, they find her quickly, and it looks like she made a new friend. But it runs away when Mike pulls out his gun! Darling, baby, you could have been hurt. Mommy, weren't you wearing a... Oh, there it is. After asking Debbie where she found the hellhound, she leads them outside where the dog has somehow chained itself up. That is one talented dog. Oh, and they find the sleeping members of a polygamous satanic cult or some shit, but who cares? The dog can tie itself up. Maggie and Debbie lock themselves in the bedroom while Mike goes looking for Torgo, but it turns out Torgo has also made his way to the master's sleeping quarters. I want her. She's mine, 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 do you hear? Mine? You're the worst. You were his first wife. He doesn't want you anymore. Now even I don't want you. I still can't believe Torgo's voice was dubbed. It fits the character so perfectly. Which is more than I can say for the rest of the cast. After claiming he doesn't want the oldest of the wives, he immediately contradicts himself by doing that weird hair fondling thing again. You know, if he just reached out and grabbed her breast right now, I think it would actually be less creepy. Well, at least we actually see her take the handkerchief off this time. And apparently that's not the only thing she's taken off. Hey, this movie may not be so bad after all. Oh god, I take it back, I take it back! After perving at the window, Torgo decides he's finally had enough of Mike and clubs him over the head. It's too bad for Mike, but on the bright side, now they have a main course for dinner. Torgo then proceeds to tie Mike up, which takes an absurd amount of time because he's an uncoordinated fuck. And now it's finally time for the Master to awaken. <laughs> And believe it or not, the movie actually cuts back to the picture of the master just in case you didn't already figure out on your own that yes, this is the same guy. You know, just in case you happen to be a complete moron. And then we- oh Jesus, are they seriously still going at it? They gotta come up for air sometime. And of course, the sheriff has to ruin their fun again. Have a heart, will you? Go chase that other couple. What other couple? Um... Uh... Line? Who's idiots that went deeper in the desert? We know that this road goes nowhere. But the road to nowhere leads to me. He tells the kids to get a fucking room already, and they drive off. So are we supposed to say something here, or... No? Alright, whatever. Meanwhile, the master starts reciting a prayer to his god, Manos, and I gotta say, it's pretty well done. So it should come as no surprise that it wasn't written by Hal Warren. The script originally called for Tom Naiman, who played the master, to just stand there. Seriously, that's it. Naiman thought that was incredibly boring, which, to be fair, would have fit well with the rest of the movie, so he decided to make up some sort of unholy prayer on the spot. And it actually works. I'm glad someone here was trying to make a good movie. It didn't work, obviously, but at least he tried. Arise, my wives, and hear the will of my nose. Ah, I have made a terrible mistake. Now that the wives are awake, they immediately start to argue about who should be killed and who should be brought into their happy little cult. The woman is all we want. The others must die. They all must die. We do not even want the woman. Did she just... The woman is all we want. The others must die. They all must die. We do not even want the woman. Thought so, just checking. While they all seem to agree that Mike should die, and who could blame them, there's some disagreement on whether Debbie deserves to get the axe. Manos loves women. She will grow up to be a woman. Oh, so that's how aging works. Their bickering soon devolves into what is hands down the most pathetic attempt at a sexy cat fight I have ever had the misfortune to witness. This is just painful to watch. And what is up with the soundtrack?
You know, while I will admit the music is performed very well, and that's true of the entire movie, really, I don't think speedy jazz music is a good fit for this scene. But I think I have the solution. And here we see the wild Torgo in his natural habitat, resting peacefully on a pile of his own dung. The master walks into the room and wakes Torgo, who immediately rises to greet him. Who immediately rises to greet him. Who immediately- oh, forget it. The master says he is most displeased with Torgo's behavior at the tomb. The women have told me. They may not be able to say anything or move when you're there. But they remember everything you say to them. And everything you do to them. Seriously, Torgo, that weird hair-groping thing you do, even by my standards, that's just creepy. And I get the feeling that's not the only thing Torgo has been up to. If you look at the wall behind him, you'll notice one of the dresses worn by the master's wives, as well as what appears to be a noose. Perhaps Torgo has been playing a bit of dress-up while doing some autoerotic asphyxiation? Or maybe the director hung that stuff on the wall just because he needed a place to put it, and he didn't bother to take it down when he shot this scene. But my version is more likely to give you nightmares, so... we'll stick with that. You're welcome. You have failed us, Torgo. For this you must die. The master then backs Torgo into a corner and... Um... Stares him to death? Manos, God of primal darkness, as thou hast decreed, so have I done. You know, this reminds me of something that has puzzled me for many years. Why is it that seemingly everyone calls this movie Manos, The Hands of Fate, when the correct pronunciation is, in fact, Manos? I suppose I could understand if you only saw the title and didn't realize it was a Spanish word, but even people who have seen the movie still pronounce it Manos, even though it is never pronounced that way in the movie. I suppose I should blame Mystery Science Theater for this. After all, they started it. Well, you know, Manos. Right, right. Not in so many words. You know, Manos. Oh, yeah, I hear ya. And I'm not sure how they made that mistake, since they obviously had to watch the movie before scripting the episode, but they did, and people have been saying Manos ever since. The only people I've ever heard pronounce the title correctly are the surviving cast members. It's very strange, but I guess it's not that big a deal. You say Manos, I say Manos, let's call the whole thing... shit. Getting back to the story, or lack thereof, one of the wives has wandered away from the battle royal and stumbled upon Mike, who is still unconscious. And as if the movie wasn't weird enough already, she starts... licking him. Oh, to have been a fly on the wall when Warren gave this young woman her instructions for this scene. Okay, so first you're going to kneel down next to me and start passionately licking my face. Wait, what? And then I want you to slap the shit out of me. What the hell did I sign up for? And while you slap me, I want you to say, Mommy's little boy has been very naughty. My god, you've got more issues than a newsstand. Meanwhile, dear sweet lord, are they still going at it? Still? I never thought I'd be begging for a movie to stop showing me beautiful scantily clad women, but here we are. The master finally shows up to put a stop to this madness and, oh, I guess the master didn't kill Torgo after all but he quickly has two of his wives correct this oversight. Kill! 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 And so the ladies proceed to... gently massage Torgo to death. I just... I got nothing. Somehow this massage of doom actually does the job. And then the... wait... No, I guess he's still not dead. Are you going to kill him or not? Make up your mind! And then, with what is sadly the best-looking jump cut in the movie, the master gets himself some barbecued Torgo hand. Unfortunately, this is the last we ever see of Torgo. But on the bright side, now we have dessert. 
Meanwhile, Mike has finally woken up and easily breaks his bonds. Great job tying him up, Torgo. He goes back to his family and they all agree it's time to run for the hills. We'll hide in the desert, someone will help. Just how many people, helpful or otherwise, are you expecting to find in the desert? With the master and his wives in pursuit, they flee into the desert. Actually, they don't really flee so much as stumble. Seriously, I am amazed at how often these idiots trip over themselves. I've seen toddlers with better coordination. I can't make it, Mike. <laughs> I can't make it. This walking thing, it's, it's just too difficult. <laughs> Let's go back. They'll never think of looking for us at the house. You know, you might have a point there. Does she? Mike uses his gun to scare away some stock footage of a snake, and the shot is heard by the sheriff and his deputy. Just in case you forgot they were in the movie. Well, we've searched all the way to the end of the car. Guess there's nothing more we can do. Let's go grab a drink. I got first round. And yes, that's really all they do to check out the source of the gunshots. As you may have guessed, this is yet another limitation of the equipment they used. They didn't really have any portable lighting for the shoot. In fact, many shots were illuminated by headlights, and if the actors wandered too far away from the camera, they'd just disappear into the darkness. So they had to limit their movements as much as possible, no matter how ridiculous it looked. Of course, they could have fixed this by adapting the script to work within these limitations, but that would require actually thinking about what the hell they were doing. And they didn't have room in the budget for thinking. They return to the house and oh what a surprise, the master is waiting for them. Oh shit, he shot him out of focus! And then... Wait... What is this? Where are we? Who are they? Why are they here? How is this movie still not over? Sure is good to get away. Damn the rain. Vacations are fine, but this one should be great. Really? That's the line read you're going with. Vacations are fun, but this one should be great. I mean, I don't know if there is necessarily a right way to read that line, but if there is, it's not that. Then we get some long and boring driving shots because the movie totally needed more of those and more of these two, apparently. And somehow these ladies also end up at the master's place. And who should be there to greet them? Welcome. And ladies and gentlemen, this movie certainly has some questionable moments, but they saved the worst for last. Wait for it. Wait for it. And... There. <laughs> I take care of the place while the master is away. If you could let the master know I did a good job on one of the comment cards, I'd appreciate it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Manos, the Hands of Fate. The story makes no goddamn sense, the acting is mostly crap, the directing is all crap, production values are non-existent, and it can get really boring at times. The movie clocks in at a little over an hour, but it feels about three times as long thanks to the ridiculous number of shots that either feature nothing happening at all, or just go on far too long. I honestly have to wonder if any footage ended up on the cutting room floor at all. It certainly looks like Warren kept every single frame whether it made sense to or not. The cast and crew had a pretty good idea that they were not exactly making a masterpiece and pointed out several problems during the shoot, but Warren always reassured them that they had nothing to worry about since any problems could easily be fixed in post-production. Unfortunately, Warren knew as much about post-production as he did about every other aspect of filmmaking. The movie's premiere in El Paso was a complete disaster, obviously, and all of the cast and crew were so embarrassed they snuck out of the theater before the movie ended. Somehow, Warren still managed to find a distributor for the film, and while it wasn't given a nationwide release, it did play in a few drive-in theaters in Texas and New Mexico. Even with its remarkably low budget, the film failed to break even, and since the cast and crew were promised a percentage of the film's profits, they ended up with nothing. So technically, I suppose Warren did find a way to pay everyone 300%.
you know, because it was 300% of zero. The only two members of the cast who were compensated in any way were Jackie Naiman, who received a bicycle, and the dog, who received a bag of dog food. Although he did admit the film was crap, Hal Warren suggested Manos could be turned into a decent comedy if it were redubbed. Turns out he wasn't too far off. Mystery Science Theater 3000 did manage to get some good comedy out of the otherwise boring film. Torgo even became a recurring character on the show over the next two seasons. And several years later, former MST3K members Mike Nelson, Bill Corbett, and Kevin Murphy, now known collectively as Rift Tracks, revisited the film during one of their live shows with an entirely new set of jokes. And it was glorious. And that is how a McRib is made. <laughs> And the hijinks didn't stop there. Manos has also inspired several comedy stage adaptations, including a puppet show called Manos The Hands of Felt, an attempted sequel with members of the original cast called The Search for Valley Lodge, which was reportedly scrapped after one week of filming, another sequel currently in production called Manos Returns, created by Jackie Naaman Jones from the original film and also featuring the return of Tom Naaman as the master, a micro-budget prequel called The Rise of Torgo, also still in production, and an 8-bit retro-style video game. That's quite a lot for a film that has often been called the worst movie ever made. A label I'm not sure I agree with. On a technical level, yeah, it's fucking horrible, and you could certainly make a case for it being the worst ever. But technique is only one aspect of filmmaking. Personally, I've seen several movies that are far more infuriating. I would certainly take Manos over the worst of Adam Sandler any day. That being said, if you feel it's the worst movie ever made, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. It's definitely a train wreck. But regardless of the quality of the film, I do have to give some credit to Harold P. Warren. He said he could make a film all on his own, and that's exactly what he did. Sure, it didn't turn out as well as he would have liked, but technically he still won his bet with Sterling Siliphant. If you have never seen Manos, The Hands of Fate before, I recommend watching either the MST3K version or the Rift Tracks Live version. Either should give you plenty of laughs, or hell, go ahead and watch both. However, if, and I want to be clear, this is definitely not for everyone, if you are feeling brave enough to watch the standalone, unriffed version of the movie, it was recently given a restored Blu-ray release. Yes, this is real. A young man named Benjamin Solovey recently acquired a work print of Manos in a film auction, pretty much by accident, and through Kickstarter raised funding for a restoration of the film since the only copies available to the public were based on low-quality VHS transfers. The end result is quite impressive. Granted, restoring a film like Manos could be seen as turd polishing. Nevertheless, Solovey and his team polished the hell out of this turd, and this is easily the best Manos has ever looked. If you're going to watch the Unrift film, this is definitely the way to do it. If nothing else, I recommend it for aspiring filmmakers, as it's a great lesson on what not to do. So what should we do next time? Hmm... What to do, what to do. Wasn't there a big movie coming out sometime in November? Could do something with that. Uh, it's not Star Wars, that's December. Uh, I don't think there's much I can do with the Hunger Games. By the Sea? I don't even know what that is. Uh, oh yeah! I once caught a fish this big.